merry go, merry go, merry go round. Do do do, merry go, merry go, merry go round. Do do do, me and you can go merry go round. It's very easy, just go up and down. Come on, come on, let's merry go, merry go. Viewers with epilepsy are advised not to watch the following program, as certain scenes are not funny. I love clubbing. This is a Wednesday night at called Dirty Burger. It's predominantly tower Transmission Stella Overdrive Jam and Spoon with a lot of hard hands and sloppy wonka thrown in on the overbeat. Pretty mainstream, I suppose. Hey, Alexa! That's Mobius T, yeah. He runs Wee Wee's on DJs at Super Mandelson, yeah. Now, a lot of people credit him with inventing ear music, but. I've never been to a club in my life. Honestly, I'm sick of my subconscious. It's like it's got a mind of its own. I mean, take my memory, or rather my lack of it. A psychologist would see tremendous significance in that. I mean, I'd forget me head if it wasn't attached to me body by muscles, ligaments and me esophagus. But recently, I became very depressed about me health, so I decided to start eating health foods. Now, the thing about health foods is they don't make you live longer, it just seems longer. <coughs> Would you like another bath mat? <coughs> eating health foods in a health food restaurant is like having a near-life experience. But essentially, when you're worried about your health, what you're really worried about is death. I mean, I notice now that when I get a newspaper, the first page I turn to is the death notices. You know, the death notices. Isn't it amazing how all these people manage to die in alphabetical order? When people talk about illness, though, they use a lot of euphemisms out of fear, don't they? When they talk about cancer, they call it the big C. He's got the big C. Mind you, recently, a friend of mine who lives in Los Angeles, he died from the big H. Yeah, the big H. He was walking past a Hollywood sign and the big H <laughs> fell on him. Healthcare in this country is still in something of a crisis, but it could be worse. I mean, it could be like the Middle Ages, couldn't it? I mean, healthcare was so bad in the Middle Ages, like, the average life expectancy was like eight. I mean, a really grizzled old sea captain would be like five years old. Ha 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 ha! me timbers! Ha 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 ha! Oh, me parrot's falling in the water! <laughs> I try and do what I can for. Disabled people, you know. I've actually got a disabled driver, which means I get one of those orange stickers, which means I can park where the bloody hell I like. It's funny, isn't it, when you see people taking other people in wheelchairs round the supermarkets. They always seem to use them as shopping trolleys. Oh, yeah, I think I could do with another £200 bag of cement, yeah. <laughs> Like a lot of people in show business, I do what I can in the voluntary sector. 
Hello, Pharisees. How can I help you? Yeah, I've got my wits here. My wife's left me and I've got sat for my job. And now the house is going to be repossessed. Sorry, mate. Not my problem. Childhood was great, wasn't it, eh? Everything seemed so much more exciting then. And the television programmes. I spent most of my childhood hiding behind the couch. That's because it was the only place I could masturbate without being discovered. Of course, my parents assumed it was because I was frightened of Doctor Who. Nationwide, Blue Peter, Jack and Ori, Magpie and Top of the Pops. They finally gave up trying to convince me that Hector's house wasn't really, really, really terrifying and left me tea on a tray. But Doctor Who was scary, wasn't it? I mean, every comedian makes the same crap joke about how come if the Daleks were so powerful they couldn't get up the stairs? I mean, haven't they ever heard of the standard Dalek stair lift? Escalate! 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 Annihilate! Annihilate! Next. Oh. Overthrow! Overthrow! Thanks very much. Next. Eradicate! Eradicate! Next! Uh. Irradiate! Irradiate! Next! Shit. Die! Die! Next! You will follow all next! Exfoliate! Exfoliate! Next! Where are the drains? Where are the drains? Where are the drains? I think we're getting somewhere now, don't you? Often, late at night in a lot of towns, the only place open is an Indian restaurant, right, for a meal and a drink. But I found a problem with Indian restaurants in that the strength of curries in different towns can vary wildly. Like, you might have uh, chicken vindaloo in Guildford, right? And it might have the mouth-burning strength of a World War II firestorm. Yet the same vindaloo in, say, mm, Ipswich, it might be as mild as a fluffy bar lamb. Now, it's really important as a measure of national unity that we make sure that the same standard of curries, their mouth-burning qualities, is exactly the same all over the country. And I am prepared to offer myself as Minister for Curries to bring this about, so that a vindaloo in Glasgow has the same mouth-burning strength as a vindaloo in Guildford. So, you're in a curry house late at night, I come in looking a bit flushed and red-faced, I push your girlfriend off her chair, right, and stick me head in her prawn danzac. Please do not get annoyed. I am engaged on work of national importance. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's strange that the two atomic bombs which heralded the dawn of the nuclear age had such twee names. The bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were called Fat Man and Little Boy. It's as if the Americans were trying to soften the blow to the Japanese civilians in some small way. Your entire family has been wiped out by a bomb brighter than a thousand suns. Oh my god! It was called Little Boy. Oh, what a sweet name. Have you got a photograph? Once your nuclear device is armed and primed, it's time to get out the Names for Your Nuclear Weapon book. Available from all good bookshops and pentagons. No, no, I really don't think it's an Annabella. I really don't. How about Brigadier Billy? Mm, I like Jolly Peter. Uh, Mickey Mushroom? Billy Joe? Binky? No, I still like Jolly Peter. 
And it's not just names. During the Second World War, bomber crews used to chalk messages on the sides of their bombs. Things like, up yours, Adolf, and stick this up your gables. But perhaps the most famous message of all was written on April the 17th, 1943, by forward gunner Philip Arthurs. Are there any Germans out there interested in football? Especially Tottenham Hotspur and rambling. Reply guaranteed, Philip Arthurs, Biggin Hill Aerodrome, UK. Please send photo. For God's sake, man, run! Just a moment, give me those! Yes, yes, they're on that bomb. Dear Philip, I am Hans. I fly hindquarters but prefer Dorniers, and I too love the Spurs and the Rambling right soon. P.S. Your last bomb destroyed my home village. Good shot! It was remarkable correspondence. A friendship in spite of war that sadly was also rather dependent on war. Eventually, Philip was court-martialed for sending Hans a transcript of an entire season's worth of Spurs programmes and wiping out Stuttgart in the process. It was 1951. Ordinary doctors like your GP and that, they're called, reasonably enough, doctor. But big-time consultants in hospitals and that, they're not called doctor, they're called Mr. I'm called mister, so I must be a big-time consultant. Hope I'm not something horrible like a bottomologist. Ugh. Good wages, though. Yeah, especially if you go private. Recently, I had some private surgery done. They can do the most amazing things now to cure short-sightedness by using lasers, right? What they do is they shine lasers in your eyes. The only problem is the people who know more about lasers than anybody else in the world are old Pink Floyd roadies. So the operation's done by this big fat bloke called Jumbo. Comes into the room with a bottle of pills in his hand, big bunch of keys, you know, going, yeah, one, two, one, two, one, two, yeah, testing, testing, boo, 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 I had, I had. <laughs> Comes in, picks up a pair of laser guns, right, and he's going, <laughs> shining them in your eyes, and you're going, ow, Jesus, ow, shit, Jesus, ow, shit, ow, shit, yeah, I'm not short-sighted anymore, I'm bleeding blind! <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexis Sayon. You may have heard my Totes Toasties TV commercial voiceover a while back. Hey, is it just my imagination or are the streets at the moment swarming with alligators? And each of the alligators has a suede top hat on and the face of a Sky TV newsreader. And all the newsreaders shout in unison, Where's the jam, Mr Hussey? Where's the jam? Well, it's probably just my imagination. But you never know, do you? Well, you probably do, but I don't. You see, I have such a fertile imagination. I mean, that's what makes me such a successful writer, frankly. You know, to be a successful comedy writer, you have to have a continuously fertile imagination. That's what stops you being a here today and bros tomorrow flash in the pan. Unfortunately, imagination is not something that you can turn on and off like a tap. Nor is it something that you can direct with pinpoint accuracy, unlike 12% of the missiles produced by the British aerospace industry. <laughs> no, the same powers of imagination that uh, make you think up exquisite jests and apposite drolleries are exactly the same powers of imagination that make you think that a dollop of egg mayonnaise left over from lunch which has fallen on your arm is in fact skin cancer. The same qualities of invention that help one to create this hilarious comedy are the same qualities of invention that induce in me the paranoid feelings that my pets are conspiring against me. In fact, I know they are because every time I come in the room, they stop talking. And things are getting worse for me, hence the alligator problem. I mean, at the moment, my imagination is on cracking form, as you can tell from this show. 
all hours of the day and night. Fantastic ideas for wicked jokes, hilarious sketches, and even the plans for a machine that would harmonize the rotation of the planets and allow mankind to communicate with the insects tumble out of my brain. And of course, therefore, the commensurate leaps of negative imagination are also running riot. Why, do you know, last night I actually imagined that I wasn't a tall, six foot three blonde Swedish guy called Gunnar, but in fact I was some fat, balding, middle aged Jew. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm sorry, Bobby. Customers aren't allowed to consume their own food on the premises. But this isn't food, Mr. Papakopoulos. It's an old copy of the Daily Telegraph. Oh, fair enough. I'm sorry, Bobby. That's all right, Mr. P. <laughs> he doesn't know I've soaked the newspaper in lard. Who? You look rough. I know. I got very drunk last night. I drank a whole giraffe of wine. A giraffe? Don't you mean a carafe? I wish. I was celebrating some good news. Bobby dear, I've got you a tour. A tour? <laughs> yes, of alternative comedy clubs where all the teachers and students go. It'll be a whole different market for you. Oh, alternative comedians, alternative comedians, they're alternative because they're not funny. Well, neither are you. That's a matter of opinion. Yes, everybody's opinion. That's a bit hateful, you know, I want pills from me here. Bobby dear, don't you understand? This could be the big break you've been waiting for. This could be the biggest break for you since the police lost the evidence in your second trial for treason. All right, I'll give it a go, but I'm not hopeful. That's my Bobby boy. Mm. <laughs> All right, how you diddling? <laughs> okay, Bobby Chariot here, top warm up man, separated from my wife, sleeping in my jag on pills from my nerves. All right. <laughs> Okay, seems to be getting laughs, all right. Novel experience. Now, I'm actually, I'm actually a bit of a ladies' man, you know. I was with this girl the other night, and she came four times, but I still wouldn't bloody let her in. <laughs> oh, man, fantastic. Yeah, I was talking to this other girl, right, on the phone, and she said to me, she said, sod off, Bobby Jarriot. She said, sod off, you repel me both mentally and physically, Bobby Jarriot. Just sod off, just sod off and die, Bobby Jarriot. Just sod off and die. Honestly, that's the last time I ring the bloody Samaritans. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, all right, it's going great. Okay, going fantastic. Hey, I tell you what, I've got this terrible rash down my side, right? This terrible rash is caused by the drugs. I think that's why they call them side effects. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay, going very well. All right, now. There's this blind hippo and this blind elephant in a pub, right? Christ knows why, but those sorts of things happen when you're on Prozac, you know what I mean? Right? <laughs> There's this blind hippo and this blind elephant in a pub. And the elephant says to the hippo, he says, he says, excuse me, he says, well, I don't know what sort of animal I am. Do you mind feeling me all over so you can tell me? Hippo says, fair enough, pal. So he starts feeling him, he says, well, you've got like loose kind of saggy skin, great big sticky out ears, little tail, a big kind of chunky thing. He says, oh, great, I'm an elephant, right? <laughs> Like the hip, you know, oh, great. yeah, fantastic, yeah, Bobby Jarrett, yeah, go on, very well, go on, fantastic, yeah, oh god, oh, this is the most fun I've had that doesn't involve rubber wear, yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyway, right, so, so, so the hippo says to the elephant, do you mind feeling me? Because I'm blind and I don't know what sort of animal I am. He says, oh, great, fantastic, right. So he starts feeling them all over, right, he says, well, he says, he says, you've got like horrible short, stumpy legs, he says, fair enough, he says, you've got like a gigantic belly, he says, okay, fine. and you've got the most absolutely gigantic, Gigantic, enormous gob. Devo says, Oh, Grace, I'm a scouser. You cheeky fat swat. Get off your fat bastard. It's tomorrow we play Liverpool, isn't it? Don't you like it, dickhead? Oh, hang on, stop. Ah, no, no, hang on, look, I'll do me backy stuff. All right. I just want to hear some jokes about Jews. Jews, big nose Jews. Anybody? Get him! 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 Get him!
Of course, in modern sport, it's not the winning that's important, it's the taking drugs. It's a surprise, really, is it? When you see all the men-shaped women in the so-called women's sports and all the raisin-textured men in the so-called men's sports. Now, apparently, a lot of top athletes take growth hormones, which, so they say, are really hard to detect. Well, I don't get that. I mean, if these hormones are so effective, how come they're not bigger and therefore more detectable? But, you know, it strikes me that... The existence of drugs casts a shadow over sporting events of the past. Looking back at recent sporting events, I think, did they take drugs? Like, take the Tyson-Bruno fight. Now, before the fight, Frank was full of big talk about the fight he was going to mount. But come the night, and he ran around the ring till he was beaten. So what I now think is that sometime before the fight, Frank took drugs. Truth drugs. And then when he got in the ring, he thought, uh-oh, oh, I'm crap. Another thing I'd like to know is how they decide who gets first, second and third in synchronised swimming. Surely they all finish in the same position. But sport is basically unfair. First, second, third. What about fourth? See, I think, like in athletics, everybody who's a finalist should get a medal. And what they should do is, alongside the podium for the current three winners, they should build a trench of descending depth. <laughs> Outside offices these days, you see groups of people indulging in the new workplace institution, the fag break. Hey, boss, got a light? Matches don't work out here, buddy. No atmosphere. Whoa, Houston, we have a problem. But smoking isn't the only objectionable practice that office workers get up to that they should take outside. Hey, come on, it's my turn. Welcome to the wacky world of the office character. Meet the sponsored twats in sponsored hats. Enjoy an air biscuit or ten with the better out than in, boys. Or why not indulge in some thinly veiled sexual harassment? <laughs> yes, they're here to make your working day feel just that little bit longer. Another thing, I wonder where people who work outside go for their fag break. Hi there. Recently, this girl told me that I was a very superficial person. I thought she meant I was all skin with no insides. <laughs> but no, she told me in great detail that, in fact, I was much too concerned with what other people thought about me. I was too concerned with trying to impress people, other people, even people that I didn't know. And I suppose she was right, really. Because a while back... BT got in touch with me about this friends and family scheme. This is where you list the ten phone numbers that you call up the most and you get substantial discounts on them. So, in order to impress some clerk in a clearing house in Lanarkshire who I'm never going to meet, I put down as my ten most called up numbers those of Tori Amos, Jasper Conran, the LA Times Crime Desk, Luther Van Dross, Prince Nazim's Mobile, and all of the Backstreet Boys. Of course, if the truth be told, the numbers that I call up most are all lesbian chat lines, and you can't get discounts on those. Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm a PA in the publishing industry. I love wearing those tight rubber frocks. I've got this friend, Tia. She's a half Iranian limbo dancing champion. The other night she came round to my place with a jar of honey mustard and oh, the hot lesbo love action we had. Mm, 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 mm. First of all,
of all, I noticed people wearing those red ribbons, which turned out to be in support of AIDS sufferers. Then people started wearing yellow ribbons, white ribbons, green ribbons, blue ribbons, all in support of various causes. Then they ran out of colours of ribbons. So then they started wearing things like yellow daffodils, which are in support of cancer sufferers. Now, recently, I've noticed a load of people wearing those stupid foam collars. What's that all about, eh? Is that in support of people with terrible neck injuries? I think it could be. A while ago, some people invited me to dinner, along with somebody else who I don't like very much at all. But because the proposed date was a long way in the future, I said, yeah, OK. But now, as the date approaches, I've become more and more apprehensive. See, it's a strange quirk of the human mind, isn't it, that the thought of almost any event can be born as long as it's far enough away in the future. So, say, some people came up to me and said, um, excuse me, do you mind if we come round to your house on February the 12th, 2003, and give you, like, a terrible neck injury? And I go, yeah, well, OK, yeah, I suppose so. But you'll have to make it in the afternoon, cos in the morning somebody's coming round to stick a warm tuna baguette up me ass. Alex is back on BBC Two a week on Sunday at 20 past 10. And last orders for a good slap at the headlines tonight. Have I got news for you? Last one in the series, coming next here on BBC Two. This is BBC Two. On Friday, BBC Two will be devoting a whole evening to the theme of the potato. At 7.42, Danny Baker will be remembering the first time he ever had a baked potato. And at 10 past eight, we join all the team from MASH for a repeated classic episode. At 8.35, Antoine de Con will be explaining why foreign chips are so thin in Où est la pomme de terre? At 2 minutes to 9, Danny Baker will be trying Potatoes Dauphinoise for the first time in Pomp Stop Spuds. At 10 past 9, we'll be showing a classic episode of Dad's Army. No potatoes, but we know you love it anyway. 9.40 and Dale Winton tests your potato knowledge in the popular quiz show Chipping away. 10 past 10 and award-winning journalist John Pilger asks, what price does the third world pay for the West's obsession with potatoes? In the award-winning documentary, Blood for Spuds. And at 11, the evening draws to a close with Danny Baker taking a tour of East End chip shops. The 